Now we can start working on our actual final asset. We will create its foundations in the blocking stage. We'll do a simple design. I recommend that you only use two or three base colors like I do. Here I will have some blue, some orange and some gray. And we will do it in two parts. First, we will build the shape. We will build the silhouette of the individual components of our game asset. And second, we will do some base lighting work. We will add some shade in certain areas to suggest where the light is and where the shadow is on our asset. And in the next video, we will explore three different techniques in Krita that you can use to block in your assets as fast as possible. Blocking can be approached in a few different ways. You can paint freely on the canvas and build up your asset in a traditional way. I'm going to show you a different approach though. For the assets that need to look sharp on the screen, this can be UI element, gameplay related elements in general, I like to draw the silhouette of the different components of my object on a large document and each part is on an individual layer. There are two reasons for that. This will give us a sharp mask to paint into with the alpha lock functionality. It will also allow us to focus on the shape of each part of our game asset individually and to use the liquify tool to sculpt it if we need to. Let me break down the creation process of each shape layer. First of all, you have to create a layer and ideally set the opacity to about 50% to be able to see the sketch through your layer as well as the precise outline of what you are drawing on top. Then you can draw the outline of your silhouette and for that I'm using a fixed size brush with weighted smoothing on. As far as the smoothing parameters are concerned, I'm using a distance of about 40 to 80 pixels and I keep the scalable distance parameter on. Then it's time to fill the shape with the fill tool when it is closed. You have to check the fast mode off. I use two to three pixels of grow selection and then I ensure that limit to current layer is checked just so that Krita ignores the pixels on other layers to apply the fill. The shape doesn't have to be completely clean when you draw it. You can clean it up thereafter as a last step with the eraser and the liquify tool. A complex shape like the bottle's body would be hard to draw perfectly at first. Sometimes it's a bit hard to connect the outlines beautifully. In that case, I invite you to connect it sloppily, to fill it, and then you erase and paint over the bad looking parts. This is a process that you have to repeat for every single part or component of your game asset. Now, how you break it down exactly is really up to you. I like to break down my shapes a lot just so that it's easier to paint the overlapping shadow. But for simpler assets or when I feel comfortable painting the overlap traditionally, I might only use two or three layers. If you want to achieve a pure traditional painterly look, you can use less layers, only three or four maybe for a bottle like that. I also want to mention another technique I use when adding the rope. I'm adding each ring on its own layer to paint, again, the overlapping shadow more easily. But what's important here is I'm using a larger ink brush and I'm painting the whole silhouette in one stroke. This is something we'll do more and more in volume 2 of the training as it can be faster than actually painting the outline and filling it every time. It is the fastest way to create your silhouette for simple shapes like these. Now you will notice that I'm also building the color palette at the same time. I'm picking a starting tint with the color picker and then later on I modify it with the hue saturation filter. This is assigned to the Control u keyboard shortcut. We haven't talked about it yet in the training and we will do so in the next chapter. This filter allows you to break down a color into three very handy components, hue, saturation and lighting and to then tweak them individually. And Krita will give you a preview in real time. This will only affect one layer or your currently active selection at a time. 
so you can safely apply it to a single part of your layer at a time. This is one way to use the hue shifting technique, which I've talked about on the past in a free series on colors on the GD Quest channel. So I invite you to check it out. That way I can pay close attention to the relationship between the blue, the gray and the orange and make sure that they work well in conjunction with one another. Before we talk about the lighting phase, I want to talk a bit about organizing your document. I really invite you to group layers together as you move forward. You have to control the order of your layers if you want to have proper overlap between the various components of your game asset. To do that, in Krita, you can use a few tools. First of all, you have the page up and down keyboard shortcuts that allow you to navigate in the layers hierarchy to select different layers. And with control page up and control page down, you can move the selected layers up and down in the layers hierarchy. You can also press the R key and click on the canvas to pick layers. And if you keep the shift key down, you will be able to add layers to your selection. So with that, you can organize your layers without having to click and drag on the layers docker. On top of that, I invite you to group relevant layers together just for the sake of clarity. That way you can fold certain groups together and you can also take advantage of the new color tags in Krita. In the latest alpha, the developers change one thing. You can now tag a group and it will tag all of the layers it contains at once. Then you can use layer filtering in the layers docker to hide all of the other groups in the hierarchy and focus on what you want to work on. I like to color the groups as well later on in the process so that when I come back to the document after a while, it's easier for me to spot the various components. I don't have to pay attention to the name of the layers anymore. I just look at the colors. To wrap up the blocking phase, I'm adding some lighting information to get a sense of the volume of the object but more importantly, to have some base shade to play with when we start painting with the color smudge brushes. To do that, I'm using a soft airbrush. I like to use that as it really suggests the roundness of the form, but you can use any brush you want. Some people like to work with a basic sharp round brush as well. To ensure that we paint inside of the shapes, we can use the alpha lock parameter that's at the top of the interface in the toolbar. Another tool that we can use is the clipping groups that you can add with the control shift G key combination. These will allow you to keep the shadow on its own separate layer. But I do prefer to keep a bit of that traditional workflow and to paint directly inside of each component. That's why I'm using the alpha lock. However, if you decide to do it like me, you will probably have to toggle the alpha lock on and off pretty often. That is why I assigned it to the slash key in the keyboard shortcuts editor. One thing I add pretty fast is the shadow on the background. I don't make a large cast shadow, just a bit of contact shadow against the ground. This is quite useful as it instantly makes our asset more 3D looking and it will help us to add proper lighting to the bottom of the bottle. The light comes from the top and a bit from the left, meaning that the shadow and the cast shadows will go in the bottom and the right corner of the shapes. I'm also adding some bounce lighting, some highlight at the bottom as you can see, and contact shadow between the various elements that make up the bottle. And with that, we get to the point where we have our blocking done and we are ready to start refining the piece, giving it some texture, some material, and to add some more details. But in the next video, we will look at some blocking tips instead, and then we'll move on to refining.